When people think about range management, they generally jump straight to thinking about grazing management. So although in this class, we've talked a lot about all kinds of range management for many different uses today, we actually are gonna talk about grazing management. So this is Karen Launchbaugh at the University of Idaho, and this is part of the Rangeland Principles class. When you start to make decisions, about grazing management on a piece of land, just remember that you have a certain set of resources that will determine what grazing management decisions you're gonna make. Those include the kind of land you have, what's the climate you're working in, what are the kind of wildlife species you have on your property, and, and the management philosophy and goals um, that the manager has. Those things influence what livestock species is selected to graze, how many animals are grazed, and when a pasture is rested or grazed. So when a pasture is rested or grazed this would be part of a grazing system that we'll talk about later. Those are important because they influence the real heart of the property. They influence the vegetation community that's gonna be there, the, how productive the livestock are and the wildlife community. So in the middle of this graph, these livestock um, grazing management decisions are really important. If you focus on the resources you have for grazing, the decisions you have to make, and the responses, and you put those into the actual steps that you would use in a grazing management plan, I would limit them down to about six. So think about what elements there are, the principles of a grazing management plan. So let's take a look at this video that outlines four of the most important principles for good range management. What makes a riparian area healthy? This is a question we get asked a lot at Cows and Fish. The answer is not really one thing. In fact, it's several interconnected things related to water, soil, and vegetation. Riparian areas are the green zones of water-loving vegetation next to streams, rivers, lakes, and wetlands. The plants are water-loving, the soils are wet most of the year, and water is present at or near the surface. Healthy riparian areas are critical for many benefits we receive from them, including clean water, fish and wildlife habitat, biodiversity of plants and animals, and forage for wildlife and domestic livestock. Can my cows graze in the riparian area? This is another question we get asked a lot. The answer to this is also not just one thing. Healthy riparian areas can be a foundation for your livestock operation. The potential diversity of plants makes them unique for grazing opportunities if they are well managed. There are many strategies talked about when it comes to grazing management, but any that are successful in making grazing compatible with a healthy riparian area begins with an understanding of the principles of range management and applying those principles to build and maintain the riparian foundation. Good range management practices imitate the natural system and foster healthy native plant communities. Over the years, it has become known that there are four key principles of good range management. Principle number one, balance animal demand with available forage supply. This means harvesting forage by leaving enough carryover or grass residue to protect soils and plants, conserve moisture, plus trap sediment. Is about understanding carrying capacity and setting annual stocking rates that don't exceed available forage. Balance is the first principle to be achieved. Without it, a solid foundation for riparian and range management cannot be built. The second principle is to distribute livestock evenly. This means choosing from a long list of management tools to spread the grazing load over the landscape. It's about not allowing livestock to linger or overuse an area. Principle number three, avoid or minimize grazing the range or pasture during sensitive times. For riparian areas, this may be when stream banks or shorelines are saturated with moisture and prone to trampling. It can also include times like late summer or fall when grasses have cured and woody plants are still green palatable, and vulnerable to overuse. It might also include times that are sensitive to wildlife, like fish spawning or songbird nesting. The fourth principle is to provide effective rest after grazing. 
This means giving plants time to rest when growing conditions are favorable to rebuild roots, energy supply, and vigor. Energy stored in the roots of plants is needed to initiate growth in the spring. Roots of the plants are like a battery, and if you drain that battery by heavy grazing and no rest, the plants cannot rebound. To be effective, rest has to occur during the growing season, not before or after the growth period. So, can your cows graze the riparian area? If your plants include a strategy that meets all of the four principles of range management, and you've got the right stuff in terms of vegetation to provide the forage needed to support your livestock, the answer can be yes. It might take some investment of time and resources, but it can be done and it does make sense. Principles of range management, according to this video, plus a couple I've added, include starting with knowing your resources, balancing demand with supply, managing livestock distribution, minimizing grazing during the sensitive time, and providing effective rest after grazing, and then finally monitoring change. Let's start by knowing your resources and your goals. Before you can even think about what kind of grazing to, that you want to have on the land, you've got to know what it is you want to accomplish and what resources you have to accomplish that. That includes land, animals, human, economics, environmental goals, any goals or resources you have to bring to the table. So you might have a few very specific grazing goals. For example, you might want to restore a certain kind of plant, uh, the vigor of a certain plant. You might want to make sure that grasses, for example, produce seed. You might want either patchy or uniform distribution, which you could, uh, could accomplish with grazing plans. You might want to increase animal production. All of those would be reasonable objectives for grazing management. The second, second principle in a grazing management plan then would be stocking rate. So that is balancing the supply with the demand. We've talked about this before. It's how many animals you put on the land for a designated period of time. That's stocking rate, balancing supply with demand. The third and really important uh, attribute is managing livestock distribution. Think about livestock and how you might change where they graze on the landscape. What could you do? Well, number one, and the most important thing that we often do is make sure that we've got water. Animals will graze near water. They uh, need a lot of water every day, and therefore they'll um, tend to use uh, vegetation near water. A lot of people use salt to change animal distribution. I personally have done some research on that and don't think it's terribly powerful for changing distribution at a landscape scale, but it can change just they can change the impact on the ground. So it is important to think about salt placement because there will be a heavy impact right around the salt block. Supplements, on the other hand, are starting to be used effectively to use to move land animals away from water sources or out into the pasture. So dry moisture blocks, usually made of some something like a, a molasses or that sort of supplement, are often very effective. Herding, old, old technology, still very effective in changing where animals use the landscape. Fences, talk more about those, but they're super effective. And then we have talked about animal do, uh, behavior, but what could you do to change the animal selection or training of animals to use different kinds of landscapes? Finally, fire, we'll talk a little bit about how we might use fire or other ways to change the vegetation and therefore change distribution. So managing livestock distribution is really important. Just remember there are some things that we can't change. Um, we, it's difficult to change forage supply. Yeah, we can change quality a little bit, but the total forage amount is really given by the land, the soil resources, and the climate that we have. Can't change the weather, even though weather changes animal distribution. It's hard to change the aspect of a slope. It's hard to change pests like flies or mosquitoes. So there are a lot of things that are changing animal distribution that we don't have much control over. However, there are some things we can change. We can change distance to water. We can change the type of animal we use and that affects how they use the topography. We can use enticements like supplements. We could use encouragement like herding animals. We can use disincentives like fences and a whole ton of other things that are part of that art of range management.
As mentioned, two ways that we commonly get animals to use parts of the landscape that have low use would be water distribution and, and salt or supplement. So in this case, we might develop water in areas away from riparian areas to draw animals up onto those hillsides that have low use. And again, low moisture supplements and sometimes salt can be important in drawing animals to locations away from water sources like riparian areas. Water we've talked about as being a really important way to change animal distribution. Just remember that how far animals will graze from water depends on both the animal and the land. For example, uh, sheep graze further from water than cattle. Some breeds of, of livestock like Brangus graze further from water than other breeds like Angus cattle. Young animals tend to graze further from water than old animals. Uh, so the age and class and type of animal can change how far they'll graze from water. And then of course, land characteristics. In really rough country, you might not be able to expect more than say a half a mile uh, from water where you might see animals graze. On the other hand, in really flat level rolling country, animals might be able to travel a couple of miles from water and still use forage. So the land and the water are both really important. How and where animals use the landscape really depends on the animal. So animal characteristics matter, such as the species of the animal, the class of animal, like age, sex, or physiological state. And some animals just have more natural abilities to use tough landscapes than others, depending on their breed or genetics. This is some research we've seen before, but just to read from uh, work by Ganskop and Babber, where they show that uh, cattle don't use landscapes very well when it gets to about 20% slope. That would be a very low use, whereas other animals like bighorn sheep tend to be insensitive to slope at all. In fact, they tend to use really steep slopes just as easily as more level country. Where animals graze is also defected by their species, by their uh, diet preferences. So goats prefer woody plants and therefore they might use areas of the pasture that have more woody plants. On the other hand, cattle and horses are roughage feeders and they like grass. So they might use areas of the pasture that are more grassy or have more abundant grass resources. Prescribed burning is one technique that we can use to change animal distribution because we change the quality of the forage by burning off some of that dead material. And this was a study that was done by Ganskop with the ARS lab near Burns, Oregon. And what he did in this experiment was he had collars on, GPS collars on cows. So every little dot in this map on the left is a location of a cow that was taken by a GPS collar. And you can see that they're concentrated around the water and they're in the more level rolling topography and not on the steep hillsides like the butte that's on the right hand side uh, that you can see because of the um, topographic lines that are very close together. The purple uh, blob on the left part of this map was an area that they uh, did a prescribed burn after they removed the cattle. So there's cattle locations, they removed the cows, and then in September 2004, Ganskop and his associates did a small prescribed burn in this pasture. And then they looked to see where the cows uh, traveled next year and where they preferred to graze. And not surprising, although quite interesting, the animals really used that area that had been burned the previous year, again, because it, they had removed the dead material and the forage was higher in quality. So the bottom line is we can use prescribed burning to change where animals use the landscape, at least for a year or so after burning. Another really effective way we can change animal distribution is simply with fencing. There's a lot of positive ways that we can use fencing. For example, we can use it to reduce um, heavy use of certain areas like repairing areas or areas where we're doing a, a restoration like preparing for a fire, a prescribed fire, that we can also uh, reduce grazing after fire when the plants are trying, when we're trying to get plants to recover from fire. We might be able to uh, set up uh, an area like a a wildlife forage plot, a food plot, and remove grazing by livestock with fencing. Uh, we could manage season of use in certain pastures and therefore we can accomplish rotational grazing systems. But there's some real downsides to, great, to fences also. One, they're really expensive, um, a couple thousand dollars per mile to construct a fence. And then there's maintenance after that, keep the fence up and check it every spring and right before grazing. And then another real big downside is restricting animal movements. Now in this picture, there's a picture of a bird sitting on a fence. 
seems to be um, easily using that fence and not in it's not in the way but for most wildlife fences are just an obstacle and furthermore animals can hit them and they can cause damage or death even in many cases so it's interesting that the time for fencing may be over and we Fourth principle of grazing management is to minimize grazing during the sensitive period. So think about a herbaceous plant, like a herbaceous grass or forb. When, when are, would they be most susceptible to grazing? During green up, during flower and seed set, or during dormancy? Well, in most cases, we think of plants as being pretty tolerant to grazing and herbivory in during the green up or growth initiation stage. Yes, when they're really, really young, they need some time to start uh, to get carbon coming into their system and a providing growth. So when plants are really young, early, early in the spring, grazing can be detrimental, also because it can be detrimental to soil and cause so soil compaction. But after the plant gets a few leaves up, it starts photosynthesizing and there's more carbon coming in than going out. There's not a lot of demand because there's low, uh, low biomass, so the plant doesn't need a lot of carbon to keep it going and also it's a great time of year to recover from grazing because there's plenty of time there's moisture the temperature is favorable for grazing or i'm sorry favorable for recovery there's nutrients in the soil so grazing early in this season is generally not terribly damaging plants because they have the resources and opportunity to recover from grazing when grazing becomes detrimental for herbaceous plants is when they start to set seed and and put up flowers because at that time the plants are draining down they need a lot of energy and nutrients to produce those flowers and seeds and it's getting drier and hotter in the season so there's less and less resources for recovery so generally we think of flower and seeds that is a time when herbaceous plants are most detrimental to that when grazing is most detrimental to those plants once they produce those seeds and they start to go into dormancy then they have very low demand because they're now dead the above ground material is dead and all they're doing is keeping their roots alive and so therefore grazing after in the dormant season can be have very little effect on the plants. So timing and grazing is really one of the uh, cornerstones of grazing management. And it's important to keep that in mind because the effect of grazing varies according to the season, because it, that's what determines opportunities for regrowth and uh, sensitivity of the plant. The phenological stage of the plant, again, affects that uh, how susceptible the plant is and then a uh, season is important because it affects the opportunities for regrowth so this might be a little bit easier to understand by taking a look at the final important step in the grazing management plan would be to monitor for change so whatever you're doing make sure you let the land tell you if it's working or not and that, whether that be with photos like the the chart on the left or whether it be with um, monitoring data where you lay out a transect and look for changes on the ground. It's really important to monitor for change, again, whether with numbers or photos. Been skirting around this whole idea that we're using pastures to change uh, the way that animals use landscapes, uh, but pastures are very important for control of, of animals and impacts. They reduce When you reduce pasture size, you increase the density of animals, the number of animals per acre, for example, and that can do a lot for you. It can facilitate opportunities for targeted grazing. It can provide um, times of, for rest of, with pastures as part of a rotational system, and it could provide opportunities for restoration. If you're going to do a, a practice in a, in a pasture where you need some rest in that pasture. So um, we've talked about seasons and distribution, and pastures are one way to really accomplish that. So in summary, there's several things that a grazing system should accomplish on the ground. This is not an exhaustive list, but at least it should account for the plant physiology and the response to grazing of the plants that are on the ground. It should be suited for the kinds of plants that are there. A system that might work for a perennial grassy pasture may not work for one that is, uh, has abundant shrubs or even an annual grass sit situation. So it should be um, work for the kinds of plants that are there. It should improve range condition and production of the desirable plants should be well suited to the soil conditions, should not be detrimental to animal gains, may not always provide improved animal gains, but at least it should not be detrimental. And then it should be practical to implement in the ranching operation. So principles that we've talked about today, know your resources, balance the supply and the demand, manage animal distribution, minimize the grazing during the sensitive times for the plant,
provide effective rest after grazing and monitor for change.